So, all right. Well, welcome everybody. Um, thank you for joining us for what is our last installment, unfortunately, of the show where we discuss the internet ruined my life, which appears on the Sci-Fi Channel. We have a lot to talk about from last night. We're also going to do a wrap up of the season. But first, um, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Diana Graber with Cyberwise.org, and we do these talks because. You know, our mission is really to try to make a kinder, nicer internet. And I'm so lucky to be joined this morning by three women who share that vision and who I respect immensely. Um, I'm gonna let each of them tell you a little bit about their work, but very quickly, and I don't know how they appear on your screen. So I'm gonna just start with who's on my left. And uh, so first of all, we have Ross Ellis and Ross is the CEO of Stomp Out Bullying. Um, below her on my screen anyway, is Tony Birdsong, who I've been reading blog for many years. Um, she's the family safety blogger for Intel Security. And of course, my partner in this venture, Sue Chef, who is an internet safety expert and an author. So I can't do it justice. So I'm going to give each of you ladies a moment to talk a little bit about your work and what you do in your organization. And I'll start with you, Ross. Thank you. And thank you for having me. Oh, you're so uh, Stomp Out Bullying is 10 years old. I'm the founder and CEO, and our mission is to help children. We're the, actually the leading anti-bullying organization for kids in the U.S. for bullying and cyberbullying. Uh, we have a help chat line for kids who were bullied and cyberbullied and at risk for suicide, and we feel really strongly about keeping kids safe on the internet. Very important mission, and thank you again for joining us. Um, and Tony Birdsong, I'd love to hear more about what you do in your organization as well. Hi, um, I am Tony Birdsong, and thank mm -hmm. you all. I read your work, and I just appreciate everything you guys do. It does not go unseen, and um, you, t you teach me. You're my mentors, so thank you. Um, at Intel, we are the world's largest security company, and we're dedicated to keeping people safe online and teaching people how to use the internet, but my job specifically is families. And there's just so much emotional and physical that goes along with technology these days. And uh, as a mom, I have a 15 year old girl and now a 21 year old son. So I've kind of been in the trenches with a lot of parents out there. And usually my blog reflects what's going on in my house. <laughs> so whatever insight I can gather um, from my own kids and from experts uh, is what I share. Well, thank you, Tony. I'm in the trenches with you, and I know I know the feeling. <laughs> We're the digital pioneers, I think. Yeah. Um, and Sue, thank you so much for your help in putting these things together. It's so appreciated, and I'd hope that you could spend a moment telling us more about yourself. Hi, Diana. Thank you again for helping me put this all together. If it wasn't for you and CyberWise, we wouldn't even be doing these chats. So thank you again. Um, well, for over a decade, I started out as a parent advocate and then just turned into an internet safety expert, you know, by default, again, just becoming a victim of myself. And I just want to say, because of the show, you know, turned it around and became a survivor and took my own negative experiences and helping everyone else, you know, build through the trenches of the internet and making, you know, turning, like you say, lemonade out of lemons. <laughs> thank you, Sue. So. And you're doing a great job at that. And um, I also want to thank someone that you don't see. And that's uh, my partner in CyberWise, Cynthia Lieberman, who yeah. really does all but the behind the scenes work of putting these things Absolutely. together. And so thank you. Kudos to Cynthia. I wish I could give her a little hand clap that we have right here. Um, and she's really busy right now because we had a little glitch this morning with Blab. The, our original link for some reason didn't work. And so we quickly had to change to a new link. So if any of you watching could help us out by tweeting out our new link, the one you're on right now, we'd sure appreciate it. Um, we're kind of rolling with the internet <laughs> this morning, just going with the changes. So thank you so much. Um, all right, let's jump right in. We have a lot of stuff that we can talk about from last night. You know, last night's shows, for me anyway, they were very unique from the shows of the previous season in that neither of the two, never like to call them victims, neither of the two targets really did anything in my estimation that should, that they could have done differently. And um, I wanted to start with you, Ross, and get your impression on that. Right. You know, it was so sad because they really didn't do anything wrong. The only thing that they d could could do that that they did well let me rephrase that the only thing that they could have done better was not to respond to all of the the posts once you respond it's like lighting a match to gasoline 
you cannot respond. And so, yes, it's very painful. And yes, it hurts. You don't want to see those posts. And you want to know what people are saying about you. But the best thing that you can do is disengage, block and delete. And if you have to, maybe even temporarily deactivate your, your social media page. Really good tips. And, and Tony, I wanted to go to, to you and ask the same question. Your estimation, is there anything that either of the two targets could have done differently last night? It was so unfortunate and it was heartbreaking. And just especially the young man that was just really following his passion and taking his typewriter to the park and really being an encourager. Um, unfortunately, there's just haters out there and they're going to come. They will, they will always exist. Um, I really admire him for telling his story. The only thing I could have, and, and I, I, I couldn't have done anything different than what he did, except maybe seek some counseling during all of this. I know it's so easy to isolate. And when we feel alone, you know, in our, in our thoughts and, and those, those words become amplified. And it's, it's just got to be so difficult. Um, with the young lady who had the video, the only thing I could have seen maybe retracing, and I certainly don't want to assume anything of being in her shoes. But, you know, when the agents were telling her, you know, about apologizing and clarifying, I thought that, that the need to clarify could have been moved up, expediated, because it was just, it was just, it was all set up. And, and if, you, if you're going to re respond with this is how it really happened, I think her agents could have been some better counselors in that situation and gotten the story out sooner. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. And that's something that you learn, you know, in crisis management, especially in terms of online situations is, you know, we're living in the moment here. And so if something happens, address it immediately. I, I think that's really good advice. And before I go to you, Sue, because I, I really want to hear from you, but I just wanted to quickly say for anyone who missed the episodes last night, for me, I mean, they were both very touching, but the real poignant one was the young man, Christopher, mm -hmm. who um, he was a writer and it was so cool what he was doing. He was sitting in Central Park with a typewriter in his lap, writing stories and selling them to people, which is lovely, especially for those of us who love writing. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, someone took a picture and shared it and a lot of cruelty came out of that. And Sue, as a as a target yourself of online cruelty, how surprised were you by that story? Well, I think what it really validated for me was the fact that it's not technology, it's people that really ruin it for everyone. It's human behavior. And, and the second story yesterday really proved this and validated it. That poor man, Christopher, he did nothing but follow his passion. He was sitting innocently on a park bench typing. And it's the same thing with that young girl. And if I was looking again at the theme we had last night, we had, what was her name? Jennifer? Last Jennifer night, Fox, yeah. in the first session, Nicole from last week, following their passion of going to LA, she wanted to become an actress. Jennifer was an actress. And they were just doing what they were told by their bosses, you know, going out there and doing what they loved. And then they got tormented online. No one stood up for them. Again, where are the adults here? And they got torn apart online. No yeah. one was there to help them. Yeah. So again, it's not the technology. It's not the internet. It's human behavior. Yeah. And you know, I was going to say, I really would like to see the show renamed to human behavior on the internet ruined my life. <laughs> so yeah. I'm not <laughs> I, I think, wrote for a new title. I don't know. I think we're, we're so we're so quick to say internet and technology is destroying lives when in reality it's like the mean girls or the internet or like Ross, you know, it's all about bullying offline and bullying's been around forever. And again, yeah. we have to go it's it's these same bullies, but now they've found the keypad where now they can be anonymous. And now <laughs> still have to go back and we have to teach people about empathy and being kind, but now it's online. Yeah. And you bring up a good point. I'm going to go to you now, Ross, because we were talking about this a little bit earlier, but for you, what was the big teachable moment from last night's episodes? Well, teachable moment again is when you see these posts as badly as it hurts you, you cannot react. And Tony, said it perfectly that you should seek counseling if it's really so severe like it was for Christopher. But online, if you answer one post, that's it. You're going to invite a flood of other people, a flood of other comments. I mean, they woke up to what, 3,000 emails that they had comments. 
don't respond. I know you want to so bad, but don't do it because you're lighting a match that's going to ignite the biggest fire. Great advice. And, and for Tony, what for you was the biggest teachable moment out of last night's episodes? Oh, my goodness. Um, the most heartbreaking thing that Christopher said that really just shed, it just opened up an entire gate into a, to a, a teenager's heart, a young adult's heart was, you know, here he was telling his story and he says, I was feeling bad for being me. Yeah, it was heartbreaking. And, and it just, you know, it just really ignited in me than what Sue was saying about empathy. You know, the biggest thing we can do, you know, sometimes we get so busy teaching our kids and guiding our kids and protecting our kids. And we've got to stop and breathe. And we've got to just know that as parents, our job is to now prepare them. Right. I mean, the ship has sailed. The, the protecting, we can do so much, right? So just when he said that, I just thought of the word, you know, just listening to our kids and the first step in any empathy to someone else who is in a different situation is just listening. And it just flooded my heart of just, wow, I'm asking my kids and trying to teach my kids to listen to everyone online. I need to listen to them and not just listen, but respect. And if you look at the, the word respect, the Latin word respect, it means to see someone over and over again, consistently see someone and just to see their world and what they're dealing with. And um, just to respect them and listen to them, we can get so much insight and that will give us our next steps. Yeah. And you know, that's what I like about these shows is they put a personal face to these things. And, and I really like the way they not only combine the actual person that it happened to with a recreation of the incident, it's super powerful. And I actually, I used last week's episode in the classroom. I'm teaching a unit on cyberbullying right now to sixth graders. And I shared the two stories from last week with them. And it was powerful because it gave them something to talk about. They were shocked. They were spellbound. No one spoke. You know? And the big question that kids have was like, why the heck are people so mean? Like they can't get their heads around that. And Sue, I'm going to go to you because why are people so mean? <laughs> Well, I want to go back to the, the teachable moment for a moment, because I think what is the biggest takeaway from almost all of these shows is, and, and even for me and my own experience, is that everyone needs to realize, and, and what we teach when kids are being cyberbullied and bullied, is having someone to talk to. And it's not always a therapist, by the way, because when this happened to me a decade ago, Therapists didn't understand it. And, I, and I, I think I explained in one of the segments when I was on a, a, a television show and the therapist said to me, oh, just move on from it because it was just discarded as it's just online. No, words don't matter. Well, yes, words harm. Words do hurt. So in every one of these segments that we've seen and just like Christopher last night and Jennifer, she turned to her brother Christopher had turned to his mother, Anne Marie turned to family members just as she was about to commit suicide. And and every and then Nicole turned to her father who hired her bodyguard. Jennifer, what had heart had lung surgery last night. The most important thing and what we tell our youth is you have to tell a parent, you have to tell an adult. Kids need to know they can talk about it. Just as much as adults. And you can't be embarrassed about it because it is very embarrassing. The biggest fear I had was were people to Google me. And this is what even Jennifer Box said. That's right, it was Jennifer Box. My biggest fear even going back home were people Googling my name. She can't find a job. And that's what it is. And that's the biggest teachable moment, I think, of this whole series is having finding someone to talk to about it that will understand. Because until you walk our shoes, people don't understand this. They think, oh, it's just online. What does it matter? It does matter. Yeah. You know, you bring up a good point because that talking about it is it like that's what I get to do with kids. I'm so fortunate. And what I've learned is that you can't just bring it up and tell them this is cyberbullying. It's bad. Don't do it. You have to initiate these conversations with children. And I tell you what, this is something that's really living in them. And they have a lot to say. And when they start discussing it among themselves, they start creating these social norms that live in their world that they take offline, online. And then they start looking out for each other and they recognize cyberbullying. They have strategies to deal with it. They learn how to be upstanders, not bystanders. I mean, this is a very important conversation that we need to start having with children. 
So, I mean, I, I can't advocate it enough, enough, and you guys are probably sick of hearing me already, but I'm going to keep coming back to it. All right. And, um, Excuse me, but going back to that for a minute, I just want to say when kids are online, I don't think a lot of parents are aware that you have to be 13 to go on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or any of the other sites. Some sites are even 17. So there's a reason for that because kids' brains are not mature enough to deal with what can go online. So I think it's really important for parents to step in. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, you're but, addressing the next question, so go for it. <laughs> but, but to step in and really understand that the kids should not be on the, the social media sites until they're the legal age. And, and I don't care if it's private or not for grandma or grandpa because some 50-year-old guy or someone else will get in. So that's really important. And it's also important for parents. You've got to raise responsible digital citizens. That's right. where it begins at home. And it takes a village to do that. It really does. Right. It's a big job. Tony, you talk about that a lot. Um, can you speak to what it takes to raise a responsible digital citizen today? Well, you have to be involved. I know um, a lot of parents are they thought parenting at this age would be a lot different. It would look a lot different, but it doesn't. So I think the first step is just reality. Get a reality check. This is maybe <laughs> not what you expected, but they are, you know, citizens of the cyber environment. And this is where they hang out. You know, it would be like my parents tell me I couldn't cruise the strip. I would find a way to cruise the strip. I would go be with my peers. I would go connect with my peers. So just really uh, the reality check that you can't let, the mobile phone babysit your kid, just like you can't let a television babysit a toddler. And yeah. to really just kind of wrestle that demon to the ground within yourself that this is full on, full body court press parenting. And yeah. you need to be involved with your child's life and really just getting in their world and seeing things from their eyes. Um, I think that's what a lot of people fear. I think parents are, are terrified to do that. They don't trust themselves, but it's no different than learning to drive a car and some of the other things, learning to use your new power mower or whatever. Yeah. You learn an app, you get in there, you look around. You know, I think what parents don't remember is that you don't have to be a tech expert to be a digital parent because we're not talking about skills here. Kids are always going to outskill us. Well, we're talking about human behavior that are as old as time. And that's what parents have to remember that we are experts in regards to wisdom. And I always say, like, you have to be a Prius as a parent. You have to be half a therapist and half, tech, you know, tech ninja. But um, <laughs> you really do. But you, you got to remember this. I'm a, yeah. I'm a marketing company, and I will tell you, Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, and all them, it is in their best interest to design an app that a monkey could use. If yeah. they get hard, if they start putting layers on there, they lose customers. So don't be fooled into thinking that these are apps that you can't use and can't figure out because these companies are making millions and billions of dollars from being simple. Yeah. If so, I, may, I had, I had, I'm going to go to you in a minute, Sue, but I had a conversation with a parent just yesterday complaining about Snapchat. You know, oh God, it's so hard. I'm like, okay, there is not an easier app in the planet to use than Snapchat, honestly. <laughs> No. So that's not an excuse. And if you don't know how to use it, ask a child because they'll be yeah. easy to show you and help you. Let and, them teach you. Yeah. And Sue, I wanted to go to you on that. What I mean, we've talked about this before. How can an adult learn more about what's happening in a child's life? Well, talk to them. I mean, how many times you and I have both written about this? The offline parenting parenting is so imperative to online better choices. I was going to say online safety because that is inclusive of making better choices. When the more conversations you have your, with your child, really it's not like the sex talk because the sex talk you have maybe once or twice. The digital talk you're, all, you're having almost on a daily basis. I, I like to relate it to the fact, not to the fact, to the same um, relation to you ask your child every day when they come home from school, how was your day at school? Do you have any homework? You almost want to ask them, have you have you learned any new apps today? Any new virtual friends today? Let's sit down. Can you teach me something on my phone? Ask your child to teach you about your own cell phone. I can't tell you how many times I've asked my son, who by the way is 28 years old, to teach me something on my phone. He did teach me Snapchat, by the way, because that's the only way I can communicate with him. 
and it's really not that hard. I just don't like using it, but I had to use it if I wanted to communicate with him. It's just that simple. Your kids are volumes of information and they really don't mind teaching you. It's all about the offline conversations. I firmly believe that. I mean, we can throw out all that digital citizenship, which is great. What you teach is priceless. But the fact is, Diana, schools are not teaching it. It is up to the parents. So all that, all that, we need to drive parents to websites like cyberwise.org to gather their information and then to bring it home to the dinner table, like Tony was saying, and talk to their kids. The best thing they could do is bring out their cell phone and say, hey, can you teach me something? Yeah. And that's what you're gonna learn about their about their choices. And you know, my, my biggest phrase to parents is, your child has to have enough confidence that when they're online, when they're in doubt, they have the confidence to click out. Yeah, and, and Sue, I, I agree with you, except I haven't given up on schools yet. I think they're getting there. I think that they're at the point. Oh, no, I, I hope no, so. You know what I mean? I, I will see them. Program. I see the tide turning where they're starting to ask for programs like this, which I find very heartening. Um, but I do want to go back before we move on to kids again, which I know we always end up at, because these shows really are focused on adult cyberbullying, which I found really interesting. And I wanted to go to you, Ross, because I know you work with adults and kids. And can you give us some insight on how common is this, is adult cyberbullying? Yeah, well, we don't work with adults. We work just with kids up to 24. But I think it's very common. And from what I'm seeing online, some of the comments just to other people are so cruel and, and so... The, the things that they're saying are going to damage kids if these adults keep on posting these comments. I think that we need to take a, a reality check. And I was discussing with you social emotional learning. Um, it's being instituted in a lot of schools across the country. And I think we need to get it into our families too. Because for all these adults that are going through this, you know, they're going through, again, we don't want to use the word victim, we'd rather use the word target, but they are being targets. So mm -hmm. it's it's helpful to have the family, the friends support with, with all that empathy and emotional support. Um, but I think also too, you've got to learn when to walk away from that. Right. You can't um, just keep on going to it and saying, I'm a target. I feel terrible. Of course you feel terrible. It's really horrible, but walk away from it. That's the best thing that you can do. Right. And um, I wanted to bring up something that we talked about last week that I know you liked, Tony, and it was the idea of creating mobs of empathy online. Mm -hmm. And um, I wanted to ask you, where are these mobs of empathy and how do we make more of them? Well, we conceive them at our dinner tables with our families. And we go from there and it's that ripple effect. And um, I love that schools are getting more involved. I think they're getting more involved because it's taking up a majority of their day dealing yeah. with these things. And, you know, legally, I cannot wait until uh, the, the, the legal system catches up with the reality that there's a, you know, what happens on the street, the assaults on the street are happening online. And I cannot wait. And I, I hate that it's going to take more cases until this is classified as hate speech and that these people are persecuted. And, you know, the, the shows that we were watching, those people were saying, oh, I want to bash that typewriter over your head. I want, I mean, that's a threat. That's assault. And everybody's got an IP address on their computers and they can be traced. So I'm seeing more and more police uh, uh, op the officers I talk to, they're getting these cyber divisions. And so I think that unfortunately we're, and fortunately we're in the very beginning of this and I cannot wait until it all just comes together in this perfect storm. And it's really a part of our society that we don't tolerate this online. Right, and I'm total agreement with you on that. And that's why I think that we should put our heads together and get this mobs of empathy idea moving forward. And Sue, do you have any thoughts on that? Empathy tribe, that was, that was your- Well. Your love it. I like it. Kids, kids, kids resonate with the mom's idea. Like this that have to happen more and more and really not being inclusive being or exclusive, but being inclusive with people and getting the word out. If you have a platform, if you have influence, you have it for a reason and use it for good and get people, get awareness up. But I know, I know we've all been talking whenever I share anything on my Facebook page, 
about internet safety, it gets zero shares. But if I share, you know, paprika chicken, I've got like thousands of shares. Yeah. And it's just not a sexy subject. And it's just yeah. going to take conversations like this. And yeah. Continue. And, you know, it's funny because I've been thinking about this a lot. And, and we've talked about how it's not a sexy subject or interesting subject to adults. But you know what? It's an interesting subject to kids. And I know that when I have talked to them in the classroom about this, they love the idea of creating these, these well, I call them mobs of empathy, tribes of empathy. Mm -hmm. That really resonates with them. The other thing is, you know, when we talk about cyberbullying and giving kids strategies, you know, it's a little scary to be an upstander if you think you have to go up against the bully. But when I work with kids and let them come up with their own ideas, they always come up with ways to be an empathizer to the target. And that's an important aspect of upstanding is you don't really have to even deal with the bully. You can help the, the, the targets by showing them empathy, a kind word, a kind tweet. And I think that's really important for us to talk about, not just amongst adults, but with kids. And, and I know Sue and I talk a lot about that as well. You know, there's a lot of ways to show empathy online. And perhaps you can give us some ideas, Sue. Well, even through private messaging. Private messaging is great. Direct messaging. You don't have to... You know, if you don't want to become part of the, the gang mentality, because, you know, people will start they're they're in fear that they're going to become part of the gang of the other everyone else starting to gang up on them because they're supporting the target, so to speak. Um, but what I, what I was what we do also what I everybody else online is the kindness clubs have really taken off in a lot of ways. And right. on my blog, the sous chef blog .com, we had written about this. I did this with smart sign that you remember Mike miles from smart sign. They had to take no bullies campaign and they were giving out free stickers to all clubs and schools that created kindness clubs, but you don't have to do this within schools. I mean, adults can encourage kids in their neighborhoods, whether you're bringing um, meals to neighbors that are sick. The other groups that I love is like the cyber, the cyber seniors that the cyber mentors that were helping cyber seniors learn how to use Facebook to connect to their grandchildren, learn how to use their cell phones. I mean, there's so many acts of kindness out there. Um, groups like Spark Kindness, Ripple Kindness, act, even Random Act of Kindness, that website, they have all these little tiny um, things that people can do to just to implement kindness in small ways in our communities. You can um, create kindness groups even within your communities. Ask your parent, you know, hey, mom, dad, is there something we can do in our neighborhood to create a kindness group? create a kindness club. I mean, it really does start at the top. And if you get the parents motivated, the kids get motivated, it just, it's a ripple effect. And you've seen that would spark kindness. Right. And you know, it takes a moment to post something kind online. So I always encourage, yeah. you know, kids that's I right. talk to take that moment because you and, can and that's why I like those new emojis. <laughs> yeah. well, what I like is instead of doing all these selfies, which everyone is so addicted to, Take, get a little sticky note, Take a uh, write something nice on it, take a photo, post that. It's all about being kind and empathetic. Mm -hmm. and volunteering. I mean, if you teach your kids about volunteering, they're going to learn about kindness. You know, That's there's right. so much to teach them. And I think most kids today want to be kind. It's Isn't that, kids, yeah. Yeah, it's the kids that are creating the problems who, for the most part, are learning this at home. Yeah. And so learned behavior is very difficult to change unless you get to the root of the problem and get them some type of behavior therapy so that they can modify their behavior. Right. And, you know, I feel like it's a child's natural state to be kind, you know. Right. And so we need to nurture what's already living in them. And if we give them examples and give them strategies and help them along, it's not that big of a leap for them to take that online. And I really have hope that that's going to shift the tide. It's funny because a kid said to me, well, I think there should be age limits for people when they're too old to be on the Internet, because it appears to me that the older people are the ones that aren't using it very well. <laughs> so I thought that was pretty funny. OK, yeah. we have a question here and I think I'm going to direct it to Ross. Let me it's kind of long, so bear with me. OK. Um, with the Sierra story, she was a teenager and she didn't know how to respond. And she asked her mom and her mom really didn't know how to support her. It's not surprising because so many parents don't have the knowledge or experience, but it would be helpful if kids were given resources on where to go, how to handle situations like this before they escalate. The question is how to best get the information to them. Ross? 
Well, first of all, I would love it for parents to become tech savvy so they do know, but you can go to a teacher, you can go to a principal, to an adult. At Stomp Out Bullying, we have a help chat line where kids can actually go in, sign on a chat, talk to a volunteer counselor who's has all this background and they can really help them and guide them and give them the proper resources. You know, a, a lot of organizations have really good resources. So I think it's imperative that kids know where to go, you know, um, go to our, our site, go to Sue has an amazing um, advocacy site, Tony's blog, your site. I just, cyber wise, I think it's all so important. So there are a lot of resources. Yeah, thank you for that. And I'm going to go to you, Tony, too, and ask the same question. Where else can people go for resources um, that Ross hasn't already mentioned? Well, kids are good at Googling. So like Ross said, I mean, there's so much. And that's part of the problem here is, um, you know, we can we can lead horses to water, but we can make them drink. I'm sorry to be so cliche about it, but there are people who have dedicated their lives to doing this, you ladies included. And um, we spend our days trying to help. And there's a lot of information. I think it's just, you know, also cheering on bravery and courage and making that the norm and um, just really praising kids for having little acts of courage that they, you know, standing up and then just even sharing stuff with my daughter will shove things with me. And I, I'll say, thank you for sharing that with me. Just mm -hmm. little things that just affirm that no, this isn't easy, but we can do this. Yeah, good good tips. And so you're always full of great resources for me anyway. Um, can you share some places that people could go? Where did you turn to when this happened to you? Well, it, went, it was a decade ago. I mean, Facebook wasn't even out there yet. There was no Twitter, by the way. Um, we didn't have a fraction of what really what there is today. When you go back to the Sierra story, first of all, her mother, all she talked about was that she knew her daughter was on the phone 24-7. I don't think she ever really sat down to ask her daughter, what are you doing on the phone? I mean, there was no conversations, which is quite sad. So, um, you know, uh, that that in and of itself was a red flag. Um, so I, I, one of the biggest, I think, most important sites, you know, besides Ross's up there in, in the top three, is cyberbullying.org. You know, Dr. Samir Hanje and Dr. Justin Patchen have, have one of the most comprehensive websites out there that, that every parent should turn to. Um, I've attended many of their lectures and many of their seminars. And then the other one for bullying, of course, is Dr. Michelle Borba, who's one of the leading um, cyber uh, bullying. bullying we talk a little bit about her book coming out as well. Yeah, and you have her book, who she spent 10 years studying empathy. Um, and that'll be unselfie will be released on June 6, I believe. And she's going to be speaking on your blog here in June. She's so gonna be it. And she's actually launching it here in St. Augustine, uh, May 17th. I'm excited to have her. And she's doing a big TED talk in two weeks. So, yeah. So, I mean, there are some really great avenues for parents right now. Yeah. And, you know, you gave me a thought that maybe on CyberWise, we'll gather up some of these resources you ladies have mentioned and make them available very soon here in a blog post. So check CyberWise.org. And, and I would like to say that um, preemption is often more effective than putting a band-aid on a problem after it's happened. And so I would really encourage parents or teachers to check out CyberCivics.com because it is a preemptive program that I guarantee will stop these problems from happening in the first place. And I think it's really important that we empower kids with these skills to watch out for each other online because we're not always going to be there. We should be, but we can't always be there to know what they're doing. So they need to count on their little tribes of empathy to, to watch I out think, for them. I mean, Michelle, I, I, and I just think we need cyber civics. We need to fade out something. I don't know what, but we need to replace it with cyber civics because this is the world we live in. I think it's a required school and uh, class in every school across the country. I agree. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you saying that. And and what we found in the school where I piloted at six years ago, it's now grown into 19 states, which I want to pinch myself because I feel like that's progress. Oh, that is awesome. <laughs> I know. It's really cool. But, you know, at our school, we didn't have to replace anything because we had a civics, civics unit, a civics class, mm -hmm. as do most schools. And I guarantee if you're a school and you have a kid in school, look at your civics class because it's outdated. <laughs> you know, <laughs> frankly, <laughs> civics today takes place in a global village that's largely online. So replace civics with cyber civics. It's easy to do. And frankly, it's going to 
you're, you're going to meet the Common Core standards, you're going to meet the ISTE standards, and you're going to create a, a, a community that understands how to protect one another online. So I and think that's a graduation. We'll see the ribbons for the uh, empathy tribes march oh. up and get their diploma someday. Wouldn't that be good? I love that. You know, I, I have so much hope for the younger generation. I, when I'm with them, I feel their empathy and kindness. And I, and I really feel like, you know, we are just at the forefront of this whole internet thing. And I think that, you know, Pollyanna here, I think that we are shifting towards empathy if we help the kids learn how to use it and bring it to the online world. And Ross, I'm going to go to you because you're in the trenches as well. What are you seeing out of this younger generation? I'm seeing, well, it's interesting because I'm seeing most kids that really do want to be kind and they're so sick of the internet cruelty and meanness. And then, of course, you have kids who are trying very hard because they want to help, but they're, they're sort of misdirected. So they need that guidance so they can be directed. Um, we have a lot of teen ambassadors, which is really great because they go to schools, they talk online to the kids, and they're really very helpful. Um, I think that you will always have a few mean kids. And of course, you've got the trolls out there, which, you know, you just, you, you can't even give them any credence. You know, um, they're going to be there. And until the the social media sites can get rid of them, that would be very helpful. But you just and I hate to use the word ignore because I don't use the word ignore when a child is being bullied in person. I would never tell them to ignore it. You have to face it head on. But online, the only thing that you can really do is lock it, delete it. And if you have to, you know, deactivate. You know, if someone isn't your friend online, you don't need to be their friend. They're not really your friend. Yeah, we just got a nice comment. I, I should be reading them more closely, but um, from Kathy Boley over at um, Gaggle. And she said she was recently at a career fair and was surprised by how many kids, when I told them about online safety and what we do, were nodding and saying, oh, yeah, we need people watching out for us. And I, I agree with that. I think the kids yeah. they want to know that we have their backs. Um, we so. Do. Yeah, we have your backs, kids. Not that you should be at school, not watching us right now. Actually, <laughs> um, Tony, I know before we went on the air, you had some really good ideas about how we could bring this to kids via working together with companies. And I'm not going to paraphrase here. If you could take it away, if you remember our conversation earlier, <laughs> you had, okay, I'll feed it to you. I had some ideas on how we could take. <laughs> how we could take this to the kids in the places they are, which is largely watching these big shows on TV. I remember. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You know, I got to say, I'm a confession here. I am an American Idol fanatic. Oh, yeah. It's one of the only shows I can watch with my kids and, you know, that's safe and we can enjoy it. And I'm so sad it went off the air. But, you know, from where I sit, you know, we're we're Intel and, and you ladies have, you know, basically these adult companies that are, on the sidelines, kind of trying to problem solve. But really the grassroots, I think, has to come from a, a sweet spot within our kids. And what better than American Idol or some of these shows like, you know, that, that you have that these kids are just, um, there's, a, there's a million, um, that they, they're, they're using their phones to connect every day with these, they have their phone numbers. And that's how they they elect the American Idol and, and interact with the show. It's totally interactive. I love that. Let's leverage it. I mean, they and I love what American Idol does. It gives a lot of money away to the uh, it, to impoverished countries. I think they. It's just when you have a platform like that, so powerful, and just like the Sci Fi Channel as well, um, you've got this captive audience, and you've got this cancer that is eating away at our kids' psyche and their hearts and their self-esteem. I just think that there's companies like this and I know that that's just one person saying it, but let's use our power for good. This is affecting every area of society down to terrorism. They are recruiting our kids online. We, and you know, I, I hate to wait. They always say that we've got to wait till something bad happens. Well, we don't, we don't, we're smarter than that. We've evolved more than that. So um, those were just some of the ideas I had is just um, people with great influence. They have to use it for the greater good. Uh, I t I'm in total agreement with you. And, and Sue, I know you have some ideas, too, on how we can all work together to move the needle forward. Yeah, mine was more for the adults, obviously. Um, 
where I've been with um, Cyberbullying Research Center, and, and Samir is, does some great work with the corporate, larger corporations like with Johnson and Johnson, um, and big corporations like that that actually bring in people like uh, Dr. Dr. Patchen, Dr. Hanjay, to speak with their employees about online behavior, cyberbullying, and those employees, it's either for themselves or to bring it home to their families. And I think if more corporate, you know, entities would implement these types of um, online safety courses, even though it has nothing to do with Johnson and Johnson or or their products, but they do it as a benefit to their employees. If more companies did this, I think it brings you know, the the knowledge and empowerment home to the dinner table. Yeah. Because, I mean, I've attended them with Samir and what he teaches them is phenomenal. It's kids online safety too and cyberbullying. So this parent that's attending it at Johnson & Johnson, which was right here, and by the way, Johnson & Johnson, like American Idol, gives so much to our communities. They give, you know, scholarships and and such to kids that can't afford to go to college. Um, so then they actually give them jobs at Johnson and Johnson. So it's the same thing. It's all about giving back. It's all about positivity and 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 doing good in the community. But yeah. they don't have to do this type of um, seminars, and they do. It, kudos to them. I, I love to hear stories of corporate responsibility like that. And so thank you for sharing it. And we're coming close to our time. So what I want to do is go back to each of the three of you. And I want you to leave anyone listening or watching with an actionable item that they can do to help us move forward on these issues. So Ross, what was an actionable item? An actionable item. Think before you post think before you do a video, a selfie, whatever you're doing, because there are consequences. And so really think it out first. Excellent. And how about you, Tony? Never, ever, ever, ever share a nude photo with anyone. I don't care if you've been married 50 years. <laughs> don't do it. Uh, people cannot be trusted and people change and motives change. And the, our kids' brains are not fully formed until they're in their mid-20s. So as much as they roll their eyes and say, I got it, I got it, they don't. So don't ever assume that they got it, they don't. Excellent, and, and Sue, what's an actionable item? Well, I'm gonna do mine a little bit. Ross says think, I always say pause, because I know I can think and type at the same time, so I say pause. But for be a little bit different, let's take every day, if you can just do one, post one positive thing to one person out there that's having a bad day, look down your news feed. Does someone lose a loved one, whether it's a pet, whether it's an aunt, a grandparent, even if you just do sending cyber, sending a hug, every day look for one negative thing online and, and turn it around. Yeah, that's a great tip. I, I love that one. And, and for me, I would say um, get yourself educated. Go to cyberwise.org. We have lots of free tips for parents and teachers. Get your kids educated. Go to cybercivics.com. We have a turnkey curriculum ready to go. And number three, visit all of these ladies online. I'm going to go to each of you and you can tell people where to find you, starting with you, Ross. It's www.stompoutbullying.org. Thank you. And Tony? Um, McAfee blogcentral.com and we are purchased by Intel, but still technically McAfee. Great. And how about you, Sue? It's suechef.com. Terrific. And, and, and I want to thank you all, not only for spending this time with us this morning, but for the work that you do. I, I want you to know that it is appreciated. I know sometimes some days it doesn't feel like that, but it's very important work that you're all doing. So I want to thank you for that. We and thank um, and you, too. <laughs> thank you too. Thanks, Cynthia. Leader. And Cynthia, who does all our, she's a Hollywood publicist who now is tirelessly working in this space for, I don't know why, because she could be making a lot of money elsewhere, but she cares as passionately about this as we all do. So thank you, Cynthia Lieberman, for that work. And um, please join us next week at the same time, same place, different link, but same place, because we're having a really great conversation about big news in media literacy education, exactly what we're talking about right now. Actually, big news in internet safety education. And um, we're talking to to three leaders in that space, someone from the National Association of Media Literacy Education, someone from Media Literacy Now, and someone from the Digital Citizenship Summit. So we look forward to breaking some news next week. And ladies, thank you again. Go forth and keep doing your great work. And for sure, people, check them out. 
Thank, Thank you all. Diana. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.